Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Major General J.P. McGee, the Director of the Army Talent Management Task Force, uh, to this, uh, and welcome you to this professional development opportunity uh, to discuss the Army's ongoing initiatives uh, to reform officer personnel management. There's going to be a questions and answers session uh, at the end of the formal uh, period of this briefing. Uh, just a reminder to you uh, that it's being recorded, so if you're not speaking into a microphone, uh, you're not going to be heard on the recording uh, or by the folks that are listening on the outstation. So if you be patient, um, wait for one of the two gentlemen with the microphones here in the back of the room to come to you, and uh, we'll get you into the recording. Uh, without further ado, uh, General McGee. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Sir, it's great to uh, sir, it's great to have you. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming, Brian. It's great to see you. Okay, so I'm J.P. McGee, I'm the director of the Army's Talent Management Task Force. What I'd like to do is I've got about an hour with you today, is I have given this more times than I can count. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is take about 40 minutes to explain this to you, and then I'd like to take the last 20 minutes to just answer questions. And I will stay here even longer if you want to ask more questions, but to try to be respectful of your time. But I'll stay here as long as you want to answer all your questions. But it, hopefully it goes a little bit more smoothly, I think, if we run through without any questions until we get to the end, and then I'll take questions for as long as you, you uh, I've got nothing else going on today other than answering your questions. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to show you a video and then I'll talk you through these, uh, these slides and let's go right to the video, okay? People are the Army's greatest strength and our most important weapon system. The Army delivers the most lethal and decisive land force in the world as part of the Joint Force. To be certain, the Army's modernization efforts are not just about new equipment. They must include the multi-domain operations concept at every echelon, the six modernization priorities, and a 21st century talent management approach based on decades of research and analysis in personnel management practices. The current personnel system is based on a 1947 model of a mass-produced, interchangeable, one-size-fits-all officer corps. In 1980, the Army moved to a rigid structure of year groups based on time and grade and established the up or out system, forcing removal or retirement of officers who are not selected for promotion. The industrial age model of the 1940s and 50s focused on developing a large number of interchangeable officers with an emphasis on standardized career models and rigid timelines. In fact, an officer from the 1950s would be very familiar with our current system for managing officers. An information age approach focuses on learning about the individual and taking their uniqueness into consideration for their development and employment with the intent of maximizing the contribution of every member of the Army. Simply put, better information about our people leads to better decisions about how we manage them in a way that recognizes everyone for their unique talents. Young men and women today want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They want to make sure they matter. They don't see themselves as interchangeable parts in an industrial age system. The foundation of the Army's ability to dominate in land combat depends on our skill to attract and manage the best talent, giving us a decisive advantage over future adversaries. Talent management encompasses acquiring, developing, employing, and retaining the Army's greatest asset, its people, to enhance readiness by maximizing human potential. The Army is moving out rapidly in four areas. First, the Army talent alignment process matches officers to assignments. This process empowers commanders and individuals to play a more active role in the assignment process. The foundation of a talent management system is a thorough understanding of the knowledge, skills, behaviors, and preferences of every officer in the Army. The Army talent alignment process, enabled by the software AIM-2, moves us forward dramatically to gather this information. Second, we are building a culture of assessments. The Army does not have a comprehensive assessment framework for officers. Talent assessments provide a common lens through which to identify an officer's knowledge, skills, and behaviors. The Army is developing prototypes and pilots to determine how to use assessments to gather data about officers' talents. Assessments provide the Army with better information for development, assignment, promotion, and selection decisions. Third, we are developing options that enable officers to have flexible career paths. 
Last, we are significantly modernizing the way we promote and select officers. In all of these endeavors, and with the nine new authorities granted by the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, the Army has been given the flexibility to determine the characteristics of a future talent-based system. Talent management enables the Army to stay competitive, attract and retain our nation's best talent. Great organizations have the ability to make predictions about the future and enact the necessary changes before they're needed. Applying a soldier's talents where they're needed most gives the Army the agility to meet the challenges of 21st century warfare. The Army talent management approach will maximize the potential of the Army's greatest strength, its people. So the, what are the big ideas that are framing what we're trying to do within the uh, Army's Talent Management Task Force? So the first thing is this idea that you hear the chief talk about that's a transition from an industrial age to an information age and what that means in the realm of personnel. And specifically how this nests in with all the other modernization efforts that the Army is doing. So you know we're developing a new fighting concept called multi-domain operations. We're looking at acquiring technology and seeing the fight in a different way. That's the mission of Army Futures Command. But at the center of all this is our people because you know, people are the most important asset that, uh, that we have within the Army. And so let's talk about the approach that we all grew up with coming up in the Army and what we're trying to move to. So we grew up with a very industrial-aged approach. Okay? It's really formed on two pieces of legislation, the 1947 Officer Personnel Act and the 1980 Defense Officer Personnel Act. Uh, yeah, Defense, not my, Defense Officer Personnel Management Act. So those two pieces of legislation are really sort of, you know, embodiments of industrial air practices. And what does that mean when you're a large organization? It means as an institution, what you need to do is you need to bring in a significant number of people, and then as an institution, you need to get them to sort of a minimum competency level of acceptance. And then at that point, you can jam them into any position across the entire sort of uh, institution. So an infantry captain can go almost anywhere and do these jobs interchangeably. And then you, because you're not enabled by technology, have to manage this large cohort of people, and you do this without any IT systems effectively. And so you have to do this in this very rigid timeline approach, okay? When these things were, when these laws were written, they were actually very forward, you know, approaches for how to do it. But, but now things have changed a lot. Okay, one of the big things that's changed is we've got information technology that can help us to manage our people, you know, much, much better. And we've got a place where we can put this information and, again, look at officers in a more discreet fashion. So if you take an information-aged approach, what you say is an institution brings in a significant number of people, understands their uniqueness, uses that for their development to get them to be really, really excellent, and then uses them to employ them most effectively across an entire career that has a lot more flexibility within it. And that's all going to be enabled by 21st century IT systems that can help you do this. Okay, now we're not there yet, but that's the vision of how we're going, and that's that transformation. And so, you know, if our goal is talent management, where we are still sort of stuck right now is this idea of performance management and quantity distribution as opposed to true talent management. Okay, so that's, that's one of the, uh, the key dynamics as we're working through as we're trying to go uh, to move this forward. So we talk about having the right officer and the right assignment at the right time over time as being critical to this. And also that the idea with talent management is that you've asked yourself the question, who's the best officer in this room? The only possible answer is, well, what job are you looking for? And it's this recognition that different officers might be highly skilled in different fields. And it's the responsibility of the institution to start figuring that out, developing them, and putting them into a place where they can contribute maximally to the mission of the United States Army. One of the things that we don't have right now that is an impediment, because people will come up to me and they'll say, JP, we already do talent management. We sort of, you know, have done this my, you know, I've been, I've been talent management as I've come up. I would say we do this with small subsets of the officer corps. So if you're one of the 302 active duty general officers, I think you're sort of talent managed. Like they've got a plan for you. They understand who you are. If you're an ORSA or a FAO, generally the smaller groups, but it doesn't happen for the vast majority of the officer. If you're sort of a middle of the road armor or infantry officer at the rank of say major, you're not really talent managed. You're, you're sort of put into a position, you're just sort of moving along. And so what I say, the first thing we need to have is a granular level of knowledge about the knowledge, skills, behaviors, and preferences of every officer within our inventory. And then we can start you know, using that information to better, to better manage that entire cohort. And I say 
that what that will impact is not really the top 5%, but really will have a significant impact in the management of that 6 to 60%. That's sort of however we choose to define that. And I'll talk about some of the ways we need to, uh, we need to do that. The guidance from the chief and the secretary have been very clear to our team. Okay? It is not to take the current system and make it better on the margins. It's to create a new and better system. And so what we talk about is not a 10% change, but a 10x change. So what's an example of that? If you took all Ford engineers and you took them to an offsite and you said the average miles per gallon for a Ford automobile is about 50 miles per gallon, we want a 10% change, they would go to an offsite. They would uh, try to figure out how to tweak some hoses and some valves and do some things with the engines, and they would get you to 55 miles per gallon. Okay? If you took that same group of Ford engineers and say Ford's goal is that the average, the average mile per gallon fuel efficiency in every one of our vehicles is 500 miles per gallon, that 10x change, they would have to do something very different. They'd have to look at what's the relationship between an engine and the wheels. They'd have to look at what the chassis is made of. They'd have to look at driver behavior. Just as a side note, on a car, only 55% of their fuel efficiency comes from actually the engine. So they'd have to look at it fundamentally differently. And that's the task that we've been given in the Army's Talent Management Task Force. We're not changing things on the margin. We're going, trying to move and make decisive change across the way that we manage our officer corps. And then the other piece of this is we talk about changing cultural norms because some of the things we're going to talk about are things that, aren't act that are new to us in terms of those of us who've been in the, in, in the officer corps for about 30 years or so or less. But if you go back in our history, some of these things are things that we've done in our past and, and have done very successfully. So we'll talk a little bit about direct commissioning coming forward. Uh, you know, going ahead. In 1942, the Army was able to successfully direct commission in 102,000 officers in one year in order to meet the needs to fight World War II. So again, that's not something that any of us have lived with, but we recognize that we needed to infuse civilian talent and technical skills into our military and use it to win a war, and it turned out pretty well. So again, not something that we're used to, but something our Army has done. So that's why we talk about changing just a cultural norm as opposed to changing the culture of the Army. Why is this really important? Well, it's really important because people define our army. And we have probably lost our position as being the premier human development organization in the world, and that's what the chief aspires to and what he talks about when he talks about what we want to be as an army. Okay? It also gives us a decisive advantage against our near peer adversaries. Okay? So when you start looking at what combat is in the future, and we talk, start talking about large scale ground combat operations and, you know, and the national security strategy, which drives us that way, we start looking at adversaries who have populations that are larger than ours. We ha look at, at, at adversaries who have an economy who is larger or, or equal to ours, who have closed, if, if not, or at least narrowed, if not completely closed, the technological gap. We need to, as an army, take advantage of every advantage that we have. And one of our critical advantages is people. And we don't win future wars by sort of squandering the, the great people that we have in by antiquated, with antiquated management practices and not maximizing the full potential of the, uh, of the people who come in and join our army. Okay? The other piece of this is you are experiencing today the slowest rate of technological change that you will experience in your lifetime. Okay? So as fast as everything has happened over the last 20 years, think about a time not that long ago when you didn't even know an iPhone was, okay? it is only going to accelerate. And how the Army starts to be able to develop the agility to fold some of these war fighting, you know, some of these skills from the civilian world that are happening in, in the field of technology and bring them into our ability to fight ground combat operations is going to be absolutely critical because they're going to start playing a, cre a key role in what combat looks like in the future. You don't do that with a system that effectively says, you know, we're going to run this in a very conveyor-based approach that, that, you know, if you haven't been in the Army for 30 years, you can't be a general. I mean, all of these things that, that make us not be able to take the strength of our nation and make it a strength of our army. These are things that probably need to change over time so we can remain competitive. And then the final piece of this is that, you know, we are certainly seeing a change in generational norms, okay? So what does that mean? That means that today across the United States, having a dual income family is the norm, okay? And that is a, that is a critical step to being able to squarely be in the middle to upper middle class. Uh, competition to get in good schools is significantly harder than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And if the, uh, if the Army's lifestyle is increasingly divergent from that and your spouse can't work and you know, your, your kids aren't you know, well-educated so they're not competitive, we start putting ourselves at a significant disadvantage for the people that we retain within our Army in terms of retaining our most talented. Because the simple fact of the matter is the most talented people in our Army have the most options. 
And so we need to remain attractive to, uh, to these people who, you know, our most talented officers who have, you know, all sorts of options that are out there. And we do that by starting to take things like preference into account more robustly and to start giving some more flexibility and ownership of their careers as a, as a first step. Okay, next slide. So I'd like to use this as an example of how we manage the officer corps today, what it begins to mean when we talk about transitioning from industrial to information age, and some areas of potential sort of immediate or very soon impact we can start making across the Army. Okay, so this is the career forecast of, of the way we run our attrition-based model within the officer corps today. So I'll focus largely on the active component. On the left-hand side of that screen, what you'll see is every year we have to bring in 5,000 active duty officers a year. Okay, that's 1,000 from West Point, 1,000 from OCS, and about 3,000 from ROTC. Just so you know, ROTC needs to produce another 2,500 Guard and Reserve lieutenants to be able to fill out the, fill out the force. Okay, so just the raw numbers of them having to meet their mission means that they can't be nearly as selective as they would like to be. And they also can't be as directive in terms of what fields of study that we do because really there's this huge impetus for them just to be able to bring in the right numbers to be able to get to our goals for retention down the, uh, down the road. So you all of a sudden start having these sort of mismatches of things. So here's, a, here's my first of a couple pieces of personal trivia for you. What is the number one degree that ROTC produces uh, you know, across, their, across their graduates? Criminal justice. 10.8% of the ROTC graduates that we commission every year come with a criminal justice degree. And I have nothing against criminal justice degrees, but I would argue in a world that is largely becoming defined by technologies that we may want to have STEM degrees a whole lot higher on that. And you don't actually don't hit a STEM degree until you're at the seventh degree at 3.8% uh, in its general engineering for the, uh, for the officer corps. Okay, so, so that's one of the reasons. But one of the reasons we do that is because the tremendous number of people that we need to bring in. And, and, the, and we need to bring in that many people because at year 11, and you can look there at major, what we need to be able to do is the first selective cut and make 2,150 majors. So the interesting thing is, is that we need to get rid of, by year 11, 56% of the officer corps that we bring in. Okay? So we need to get rid of 50% of them already. But think about what we do to manage what that sort of, what that sort of, that 50% that we retain, what that sort of looks like. Okay, so has the Army spent any time to say, here are the talents that we want to retain for the long term within our Army? Okay, here are the skill sets that we need to propel us forward over the next 10, 15 years, and let's backtrack and try to find out who those junior officers are, who at least have the potential of having that. Okay, we don't do that. Do we survey the officer corps in their first couple of years, sort of find out what their propensity is to continue to serve and why they may get, stay in or get out of the Army? We don't do that either. Okay. We don't do any of the, do we do any sort of incentive program to identify that among those 5,000 officers that we commission, there may be some that we want to retain more than others, and we would do something as an institution in order to retain the most talented within our ranks. We don't do that as well. What we effectively do is we bring a whole bunch of people in, and we say we sort of hope enough get to year 11 so we can do some form of a selective cut to major. And as long as we've got raw numbers, we're sort of good. As long as we can do an arbitrary sort of 80% cut from captain to major, we're fine. Because we're all focused on quantity, not the talents. Okay? And that's one of the areas where I think increasingly we need to change to start shaping that. So we're actually going out and retaining those officers who are going to provide the most benefit for the Army over the long term. And then developing some sort of incentives to be able to do that. And again, incentives aren't always cash, right? They may be assignment of choice. They may be different sort of flexibilities you could provide. It's not just about throwing money at people. But at least we could start doing some force shaping things in order to make sure that we're retaining the most talented, or at least our best bets on those officers who have the opportunity to contribute to our, our long-term mission. There's a gentleman named Tim Kaine. He wrote a book. It's called Bleeding Talent. And it effectively says that the Army does a horrible job of retaining its most talented and they all get out. I would say it's even worse than that. I would say that we don't even spend the time to identify what those qualities are we want to retain. And so we don't know whether we're actually retaining talents or not within our Army because we have not done those things. Again, that's what it means to run an organization in a data-poor environment instead of a data-rich environment. Okay? And just so you know, if you're a large company or organization, if you're a large company in particular that, run, that, that manages your people that way, do you know what you're called? Bankrupt. Okay? Because if you go out to the civilian world today, what they will say, and they use this term every single time, 
they say, we are in a war for talent. Okay? We don't say that. We don't even think we're in a competition for talent. We don't even think we're in like a, you know, a fair game for talent. But, but they describe themselves as being a war for talent in order to make sure that their companies remain competitive and don't go out of business. And they don't have the luxury of sort of bringing in so many people that they can do these things. And so I, I think it's very interesting. So we, start, we are now starting to talk about going into, the, you know, engaging in the war for talent in order to be able to, to be successful. So I talked about the first you know, couple of years of an officer's career, but let's go now to the right side of that equation or that, that sort of cascading slope there, and let's talk about the way we, re, we look at colonels. I would argue in the future the most important role, the important rank that we need to optimize in terms of creation is the rank of colonel. First off, we, bring, you know, we promote a fair number of colonels, and we also now have the flexibility to have colonels stay in and extend you know, past 30 years to be able to, uh, to work on specific missions. And colonels provide the, you know, the military long-term sort of expertise on the Army staff, on a combatant command staff up at OSD. They have, a, they have an ability to be able to really contribute after, uh, you know, after years and years of, of service. I don't think it's about making general officers because the dirty little secret is the, every year the Army only produces about 40 general officers and three years after those 40 general officers are created, half of them need to be out of the Army anyway. Okay, if they don't get picked up for two-star, they're out after three years and they're sort of done. So, I think Colonel is, is, is where we need to really focus on making sure on the other end of that wing, we've got the most highly talented and diverse skill set within our Colonels. Frankly, if you have that, then picking Generals is going to be pretty easy. But then you've also got these, these great leaders that you can then keep in the, Army, uh, in the Army longer. But again, at the end of this wing, we do the exact same thing we did in the beginning of it. So what do we do to identify those Colonels who have the best talents and the most relevant talents to the accomplishment of the Army's mission? What do we do to try to incentivize the them to try to stay in? Not all of them, but the ones who have those sort of unique talents. We just sort of say, hey, look, you get to be made a colonel, and uh, you get to stay three years until you're fully vested, and you can get your full retirement, and at that point you can stay or you can leave, and you know, we really don't do anything to identify those people within our ranks who are the most talented, who we want to have stay in and continue to contribute, because at the end of the day, hey, look, if we're like 101% on colonels, we're good, right? Because it's pure numbers. It is pure numbers, and it's not anything beneath that. That's what you start to see if you start becoming an information age organization. Next slide, please. Next slide when you get a chance. Okay, so you are all Army leaders. You can go back one. You are all Army leaders. You should understand that when you start talking about talent management, we are adopting a new you know, operational approach to our management of people. It has its own definitions. Just think multi-domain operations or air land battle. You didn't get to define your own terms. You don't get to do the same on this one with the, within the Army. So there's the definition of what talent management is. It encompasses the pillars of acquire, develop, employ, and retain of our people. And we say as an Army that talent is the unique combination of knowledge, skills, behaviors, and preferences. And we sort of foot stomp the preference piece because that is really, really critical and it's a, it's a big change. You will hear some people say knowledge, skills, attributes. The Army has made a deliberate decision to go with behaviors. Because, and, and frankly, the behavioral versus attributes is a big psychology sort of discussion and different sides of the field of psychology will we'll never agree on this. But the bottom line is we said that we are more interested in whether you are an officer who behaves ethically than if you're an officer who has the attributes of an ethical officer. So we have, de we have decided that the definition is knowledge, skills, behaviors, and, uh, and preferences, and that's what the Army senior leaders have, uh, have agreed upon. So you should use that terminology when you're talking about this with your, uh, with your subordinates. Next slide. So how do we start moving this gigantic you know, system, this gigantic organization of the Army from where we are today to where we want to be tomorrow? So first off, you've got to identify where we are. We've got this industrial age system based on a conveyor-based approach in terms of your timelines for your officer's career. Again, I was commissioned in 1990 from West Point, and I think any career map that I saw back then, I think I was off no more than six months over the last 30 years in terms of what my different milestones would be. Um, it implicitly says that an infantry officer needs to develop at the same rate as like a cyber officer or develop at the same rate as a transportation officer, even though we know those fields are all pretty unique and, and different and increasingly so. Okay, but, but the system has a lot of you know, great qualities about it. Okay? And we, we try to list out what those strengths are, fair, scalable, predictable, developmental, resilient, and then some of the increasing gaps that, uh, that, that we have seen. I like to say that, uh, that what we're executing right now is the best possible industrial-aged process 
you can have in terms of the management of the people. Like I know no one else who does a better job in the United States Army than managing an enterprise at this scale as well as we do. And there's a tremendous amount of work done by AG professionals to make this system work every day. But it is a bit like showing up at a, with, on a bicycle for a motorcycle race because things have just progressed and there are other new technologies that can now help us do a much, much better job and there are mindsets that can change as well. So let's talk about where we want to be on the right hand side. So that's an information aged approach. At the center of that is that the core of it is some idea of flexible career paths, okay? And then underpinning this whole concept of how we manage our people are three things. Is a management process. I think we're increasingly moving there with the whole Army Town alignment process, which I'll highlight to you. Uh, and the next piece is we need to have greater organizational alignment. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question. I'd love to hear your answer. What organization and, indi well, so let me ask you another question. I'll, I'll, I'll me back up here. So for logistics and materiel, what individual and what organization is in charge of the Army for our logistics and materiel considerations and management? AMC, General Perna, okay. Who's in charge within our army of all training and doctrine? Trade Act Commander. Okay. Who is in charge of managing the army's people? Absolutely not. Okay. So it's, it, I mean, so as I've looked at this, and I didn't realize this ties in this job. Let me tell you all the different organizations that have an outsized role in the management of our people. And I'm going to give you, I think, seven, but I'm probably going to miss a couple. So G3 training, which does the funding for a lot of our officer sort of initiatives. Um, G3 FM, which does all the force management, which is under the G3, so they get guidance from there. You've got the HRC commander. You've got the G1 of the Army. You've got the ASA MNRA. You've got the CAC commander, who has all the proponency guidance in 600-3 in terms of career paths. And then all the branches work for him, infantry, armor, aviation, all that sort of stuff. And then you've got all the functional areas, all of whom work for somebody else. Okay. So we've disaggregated the strategic management of our officer corps and our people to all these different organizations. So it's very, very hard for us to achieve a unity of effort in anything that we do with our officer corps. Okay. So this is one of the reasons, amongst many, why things like MITs, PITs, and SPITs, you remember that? Remember they were supposed to be treated like battalion commanders? That never happened. Um, you remember we said training battalion commander is sort of the exact same as a tactical battalion commander? That didn't happen. Um, we talked about the AFPAC hands being something that's a key priority and we're going to do that. that. That never happened. Because we don't have anyone or any organization that's, and there's not, really not a very effective alignment between all of them as we're, as we're looking at meeting the Chief's strategic guidance and direction and the Secretary's strategic and guidance and direction. And it's been further exacerbated by something that we've just recently fixed, which was there was no routine touch point back to the Chief or the Secretary in terms of how we were doing and meeting their guidance in terms of the management of our, of our officer corps. Okay, and I should have said up front, I talk a lot about the officer corps because we've been given the task of making changes within the officer corps as a first step towards then doing changes for the non-commissioned officer corps and then eventually the civilian workforce. But I think we're small enough that we can, uh, you know, we can, we can work that piece. But again, there has been no mechanism by which we, we went back and informed the, uh, the chief and the secretary how we were doing with this critical function. So that's just recently changed. General McConville has established a new uh, routine update to him called All Things People. We're getting ready to do one for him, uh, for him next week where we say, okay, here's the guidance he gave us. We're on glide path or we're not so we can remain you know, consistent with his vision and make sure he understands where we are in doing that. So I think those are three underpinnings for a, uh, for a new system. And I'll highlight a couple other descriptors there that I think are really important as well. Okay. So uh, you can see we, we brought over the key sort of strengths of this, um, but we need to be able to, to adapt to disruptive changes. We need much greater flexibility. We need to manage officers based on talent. And here's the other thing. We need to start leveraging technology. Okay. So if you take a look at the technology systems, the IT systems that we use to manage our people, specifically our officer corps, most of them were written in code in the late 80s to early 90s and have been updated since then. And it is, it is, uh, it is not a stretch to say that we have almost zero predictive capability in terms of any decisions that we make about the officer corps, what the long term, uh, what the long -term effect is going to be. So what does that mean? That means when the secretary, like he did about six months ago, says, I want to change the policy and I want to make all company commands not be 12 months mandatory minimum, but 18 months mandatory minimum. 
We have no modeling or system that says, well, sir, you know, if you do this, it's going to increase the queue lines for you to go into command on these sort of installations. It's going to mean CGSC is going to be backed up and we're going to have people who aren't able to go to CGSC. We can't say seven years down the line, this is what's going to happen for your battalion commanders and how we pick battalion commanders. We don't have any of that. Okay. And, and that is a huge gap in our, in our IT systems in terms of how we manage, uh, manage the Office Corps. It is only a slight exaggeration to say that the Office Corps today day is managed off Excel spreadsheets and not much else, okay? Because we've got this tremendous ability to see where we are today. We've got a pretty decent ability to see where we've been in the last you know, 20, 30 years. Even that's sort of hard for us, but really no ability to see forward. And again, that is not a good IT system to help us do that. And that's what makes something like talent management uh, talent management possible, because it helps us make start making decisions in a data-rich environment instead of a data-poor environment. So I'm going to talk you through uh, some of the initiatives we've been doing, because we've been told by the chief and secretary, grab subsets of the officer population, run a pilot or prototype with them, see how it goes, and then scale it rapidly to the rest of the Army if it's a success. And I'm going to talk you through how we've done some of these. So the first one is the Army Town Alignment Process. I'm actually going to dedicate a fair amount of time here in a couple minutes about what that looks like. So that's the new system by which active duty officers are being assigned. Uh, next, I'll talk to you very briefly about assessments. Okay? So everyone in this room is familiar with an assessment. It's called the APFD. Okay? Every six months, you do an APFD. And as a consequence of that, if you took the average 40-year-old soldier and baseline against any 40-year-old American citizen, you would find there were three things that we are extraordinary on. That's our ability to do push-ups in two minutes, our ability to do sit-ups in two minutes, and our ability to run two miles. Okay? That's because we run an assessment every six months in our physical ability to do those three events. And you know whether you do it in Kuwait or you do it in Korea, and you really got the same, you've got the same objective assessment on what that means. And you all understand the difference between a 297 out of 300 on APFT or a 210, and it means something to you. Okay? But most of the way we manage our officer corps today is based on evaluations. It's based on what your boss's boss thinks of you, and then that subjective piece is in it. And I think that's always going to be central to the way we manage our officer corps. But what we're saying is we need to start folding in other information that's more objective so we can get a better view of the officer and then figure out how they need to be developed and then how they need to be deployed, uh, uh, how they need to be developed and then how they can be employed. So if you show up at like your basic commissioning courses, you know, OBC or the captain's career course, and you're a really good writer, and you can demonstrate through an assessment that you're a really good writer, why do you need to go through all that crappy writing courses if you're already good at that? Why couldn't you do something else to better use your time? These are the sort of things that assessments can help us with. They can also help us see us where, they are, where, where officers need to you know, develop themselves. So what we see is integrating into professional military education at the Captain's Career Course, CGSC, and the War College, these opportunities to do assessments, where in the first 10 years, it's largely being used for the development of the officer. Hey, McGee, you're a lousy public speaker. Hey, McGee, you don't have a whole lot of these sort of skills. Start working on these things over time. And then as you become a field grade officer and become more senior, we start folding that information in terms of how you're actually going to be employed, what jobs you may be able to go into, and, and how you can best, uh, best be used. The other value that allows us to do is, beyond the development of the individual, is diagnostically as an institution, we can use that to further our PME. So we can look at Transportation Corps officers at the Captain's Career Course and say, wow, they really have a problem with like writing or mental flexibility. And you could start seeing how then your curriculum could change to address identified weaknesses within a cohort of the officers as we're going forward. One of the first steps forward with this is at the Captain's Career Course, every captain is now required to take a GRE. We're making them take a GRE so we can start figuring out who are the right officers for us to send to advanced civil schooling, which is a significant investment by the United States Army in the future of an officer. So assignment officer can use that information to sort of say, hey, look, you're a great candidate to go to advanced civil schooling, or you might not be a very good bet for us to send for someone like that. We're also integrating in there a cognition test into the captain's career course so we can start seeing how officers, uh, you know, how they operate on a cognitive and non-cognitive ability to better you know, assist their development. Okay, so the next, uh, the next piece of this is the flexible career pass. In August of 2018, the uh, 2019 uh, NDAA was signed. It gave us nine new authorities that were mentioned there. One of those is the ability for an officer to be able to opt out of a promotion board for up to two years. If you're doing something of significant value to the Army, you can self-nominate yourself. You just open up for the first time for this lieutenant colonel's board. And you can say, I would like to not be considered for promotion for one or two years in order to give, me some, give myself some, uh, some more time. So who does that apply to? That is just think captain to major. That might apply to someone who goes down to Fort Rucker and wants to be an instructor pilot. 
and wants to spend a couple more years as an instructor pilot to develop his or her skills as an aviator before they go back to the force as like an S3 or an XO and someday a battalion commander. Instructors up at West Point who have to go to get advanced civil schooling and then a utilization, they could roll back their consideration for either major or lieutenant colonel if they had chosen that sort of path in order to give themselves more time when they leave West Point, a chance to get Katie qualified as a uh, major. Imagine a, a ranger company commander who also wants to get a uh, top tier advanced civil schooling master's degree from a, from a premier organization, something like that. But it has to be if you're doing something of significant value. It's our first step to figuring out how we can establish a system that opens up the windows for a timeline for an officer and then allows officers to sort of decide when they want to hop in for promotion boards or not. So the inverse of the opt out is the opt in and we're exploring options to develop that right now. And then the final one is promotions and selections. I will talk about that a lot more with the uh, Battalion Commander Assessment Program we're gonna, we're gonna initiate in January and some of the great work, we've, you know, some of the interesting work that we've done on that, on that so far. But, uh, but certainly there's a whole lot of work uh, on how we can improve our promotion process and our selection process beyond what we have right now. Just to understand legally that the promotion system has a lot of legal requirements to it and there's some flexibility. Selections for the chief though is a much wider sort of piece. He has a lot of authorities in order to make uh, a uniquely army selection process for selection for key builds like battalion command, brigade command. Uh, not quite as much flexibility when you're talking about promotions because there's a lot of law that, that, that governs that. So next slide. So I'll hit these NDA authorities uh, very, very rapidly. But uh, the first one was repeal the age limit. Law used to say you couldn't bring someone in who effectively, ha they had to be younger than 42 because they had to be under 62 by the time they hit retirement age after 20 years of service. Another piece of uh, trivia for personnelists, during what war did the Army adapt 62 as their mandatory retirement age? Anyone? Come on, just guess a conflict. Was that Korea's good guess? No? Civil War. That's exactly right. So the Army has carried forward 62 as a mandatory retirement age since the uh, Civil War. I know, it's a her I know I'm, a, I'm a heretic for saying this, but maybe we've learned a little since uh, about 1863 or 1864 about the management of people. That is directly tied to, uh, to the idea of direct commissioning. So we now have the authority to direct commission officers up to the grade of 06. That was presented to the chief and secretary last year. They said that is open to all branches, all functional areas. I pushed back and said, sir, certainly you don't want to direct commission infantry officers. And General Milley at the time said, hey, look, foreign armies make fantastic infantry officers. You find one who wants to come join our army, we will consider bringing them in and making our force better for them. So it is open for all branches, all functional areas, and it's going to be one of the areas we focus on this year. We now have the ability to, set, uh, to do brevet promotions. So brevet promotions look like this. You have a position. If it's a colonel's position, let's say, lieutenant colonels can compete for a position that's been identified as a brevet colonel position. And if the hiring authority picks that lieutenant colonel to be to, for, that, uh, for that position, that lieutenant colonel goes to a quick board back here in the Pentagon, gets promoted to the rank of colonel, and holds that rank until he or she departs that position. Okay? And so in the cycle that's opening right now within the Army Town Alignment process, we have 225 positions identified for, uh, for brevet promotions, and we will scale up to 770 to use the full authorization. It's something the Navy's been doing for years in their SEALs and their nuke forces, and we're, we're, we've just been given the authority to do it. We've got a merit-based promotion list. It's just half of the most recent majors promotion list, and I'll use this to draw out what it means to transition from information, from industrial to information. So Congress said, hey, look, you don't need to go off date of rank anymore for your execution of your promotion list, because what had happened in the past is a board would meet, they would establish an order of merit list, one to 1,000, and then as soon as it came time for us to actually promote people, we reverted back to date of rank, as if date of rank had any relevance to how well they had done in, that, in, that, uh, you know, in the previous 10 years or so. Okay? And they said, you don't have to do that anymore. So we went through this consideration. We said, well, should we just go straight order of merit list 1 to 1,000? And we said, well, we don't want to do that. We want to do that for two reasons. One, we thought it would break down the spirit of competitive cooperation that we enjoy within the officer corps. So we all know that like, we're not really in competition with each other, but there's a sort of friendly competition. And two, we thought officers who were promoted later on in the whole process would get stigmatized. So they'd show up in a unit, and you, know, you could just see commanders saying, look, I don't want any officers showing up to my unit who got promoted off the 1st of July in the second half of this list. And so we said, that's probably not the right answer. 
So we said, well, let's identify, let's do a hybrid. Let's identify some who are going to be promoted off the order of merit list and some who will be promoted off of the, uh, the date of rank. And so we sat down and we started working through with the people who are going to execute this. And we said, well, what percentage do you think we should, uh, we should do? And the answer came back. They said, let's promote the top 15%. Let's promote the top 15% of every list and make those guys be the ones who are promoted based on, uh, based on merit. And I came back and I said, I don't want to do 15%, but I would really, really like to do 17.12% because it's my all-time favorite number. And they said, okay, let's do 17.12. I mean, I got that, that makes sense to me. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I just changed my mind. I would love to do 12.13 now. 12.13 is now my favorite number. I love it. And they said, okay, we'll do 12.13. Like, stop talking. Just like, let's find a number and go with it. And I said, look, you're missing the point. 12.13, 15%, 17.12, these are all arbitrary numbers. And today, you can take the mathematical distribution of the order of merit list scores, you can run an algorithm on it, and you can find those, uh, those scores that are actually the identified top clusters of that group. And so that's what we're going to do. Every board that meets now is going to have a mathematical, it's called K-means clustering, analysis done of their scores. Those who are clearly identified as the top cluster will be promoted off the order of merit list, and then it will revert back to data rank. And the first time we did this with a full board, the majors list, the range was some, some categories were at 9%, some were at 19%, but it's where the numbers take you as opposed to something arbitrary like 15% or 17.12%. I talked a little about the opt-out of promotion board. I want to reemphasize that that is because you're doing something that's of significant value for the Army. That's not just because you're a sub-performer in your field and you don't want to get looked at for a promotion board. And that's why the, uh, the approval for that has to go all the way to the assistant secretary of the Army for that to, uh, to be approved. We now have the ability to allow from captains to colonels to remain on active duty service from uh, up to 40 years if they've got unique skills and they run through that process. The Secretary of the Army has now been granted an alternate promotion authority where he can identify subgroups of the officer corps and he can say they need to go through a different promotion board. Think of those officers maybe who we bring in direct commissioning and they're brought in as majors and we want to look at them for uh, we want to look at them for like lieutenant colonel, but they only have a couple years worth of OERs, so they're looking at a different population, or maybe like lieutenant colonels we send to PhDs would be another example of that. The last two are about uh, the management of the IRR and then the management of the Guard in terms of some discrepancies between when states recognize and when the active duty uh, recognize them. But again, biggest authority is given to the Army and the services since 1980, and frankly, there's sort of a piece of this that says, look, we're giving you all these authorities. We're very interested to see how you're going to expand and use these as, as some significant first steps towards changing your management of the officer corps. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I want to talk to you rapidly through the Army town alignment process, which I think is what many of you are interested in, and I think we'll get a lot of questions here. Okay. Chief and Secretary approved of these principles. A couple things to emphasize. Everyone is being moved into the ATAP process, okay? No longer is it an HRC rep, an assignment officer who calls you and says, hey, Captain Smith, you've got three jobs that are coming open for this next cycle. Which one do you want to do? You have increased transparency, so you see every job that you were available to take within your, uh, your time. The specific guidance from the Secretary of the Army was get the assignment officer out of the middle of the process. This is now a conversation between an officer who's moving and a unit that is hiring. And we have pushed the hiring authority down to brigade commanders and, uh, and above, okay? And so this is now a very different way of doing it, again, talking about 10X change in terms of how we, we hire officer corps. We have tried to loosen up the professional development requirements. So all of a sudden, if you're interested, you can go light to light. You don't, you know, we can do things like go out of the captain's career course and go to an ROTC assignment. You don't need to go right to a unit. So we've tried very hard to, uh, to loosen up many of those things that have made our, mark, our, our sort of assignment process artificially constrained. And again, we've got increased transparency and, the, and, and HRC effectively only kicks in if there is a failure of the market to find the proper match. This is a first step towards incentivizing officers and unit participation and sort of incentivizing officers to go to locations. One of the things that we've done is we've linked these brevet promotions with hard to fill locations. So all of a sudden, if you have to go to a place like JRTC or NTC or Korea, some places that are hard for the Army to fill, you can be available and eligible to be brevet promoted if you go to an assignment in there. Next slide. I will talk through this very quickly. But the really sort of three phases, setting the conditions, executing the market, and clearing the market. We've already set the conditions. The important thing for you to understand is the jobs that come open in the assignment process are found through the standard way that we've always done this, and it is all based on readiness. 
Okay, so this isn't every job in the Army is open. We still go through the standard process of saying that, you know, the Army has only so many movers and so many jobs, and we prioritize what jobs to be filled. I only say this because people come and say, hey, look, you know, everyone's going to want to be a speech writer in Hawaii instead of being an infantry battalion S3. That's not the case. You, just, you know, we will make, you know, in terms of readiness, we will make being a battalion S3 a critical job and has to be filled within the, uh, within the Army. But when the marketplace, when the regulated marketplace opens up as it is right now, what it allows is sees individual movers to see every job that's available across the Army, and it see, and allows the units to see every officer that's available to move. And it is, and then it allows a conversation to happen, and then allows individual officers to be able to preference where they want to go, and units to be able to preference their candidates. Okay? If you're talking to anybody who's involved in this, my piece of advice to you, if you're a unit or an individual, is to preference deep. Because the whole thing is set up for you to be able to get your preference as an individual moving officer, and that's the side of the equation that has the, the, the individual officer preference weights is, is more heavily weighed than anything else in this whole process. So make sure you go deep, but then also you've got to get used to the fact that like you may be getting your 27th out of 200 preferences, which isn't half bad, but it's different than when you were given like you know five, five assignment choices and you got to pick one of them, okay? This is very, very different, but the transparency is, is significant. So then when the market closes, we're gonna clear the market, we're gonna run an algorithm that, uh, that matches it. Again, individual preference is weighed. Then we're gonna stop, we're gonna run the numbers, and we're gonna check and make sure that there are any significant issues with performance distribution or anything else. We're gonna see that we make sure we don't disadvantage any units, and then we're gonna go final with the decisions that, uh, that come out of, uh, of this entire process. Next slide. So what are the gains? Quickly, the officer gets transparency. His, individual, his or her individual preference gains, uh, gains more, more, more weight and uh, an improved ability to manage your, uh, your own career. In terms of units, units get transparency. They get to build their own teams. And then we think that's going to give you a boost in readiness. Here's the big thing. What the Army now all of a sudden has, though, is a central repository for information about our individual officers who have to self-describe themselves on the back of their ORB, as well as what we want to have in terms of knowledge, skills, behaviors from different positions. And from that, we can start doing all sorts of really interesting analytics for that will help individuals over time and will help the institution out as well. And so it is for the first time us moving all this stuff, all this information into one environment for which we can better manage the outscore. It's a critical piece of moving from data, data poor to data rich. Next slide. Okay. I, battalion Commander Assessment Pilot, I will talk you through this. Okay, so I think you've already heard the Chief talk about it. He has decided that we are going to launch a new way of picking Battalion Commanders. I will talk you through this uh, fairly quickly. But what it came to us was, hey, take a look at how we select for Battalion Command. Battalion Command is a critical position within the Army. It is a, a Battalion Commander plays a critical role for the accomplishment of the mission, as well as the effect that a Battalion Commander has on his or her subordinates within the Army. So. What's the very best way we could pick battalion commanders? And we analyzed the current way and we said, well, you know, when you're a battalion commander, when you go for that board, 25 board members review about 1,450 files. And so when you do the math on that, it means they review every file in about 57 seconds, okay? Which is why we've got those tweets there because what that means is when they're looking at your OER, they effectively look at your senior rate, your block check, your first and last sentence of your, of your piece and they move back to the next OER. So what we like to say is there's, in terms of your promotion or selection, there's more information contained in most tweets than is relevant information within your OERs. And we said, is there a better way that we can do this? Is there a better way that we can bring additional information in that would be relevant for such a critical position? The other piece of the reason why Battalion Command is so, so important, it's one, of the, it's one of the true, you know, significant cuts that we make and from Battalion Commanders and through this process is who we make colonels and general officers. Okay, and so the sort of key idea was, you know, does more, you know, if we brought in more relevant information, would we make better decisions as, a, uh, as an army? Okay, so let me give you a graphical representation of this. Colonel Stallworth, would you, please, would you please stand up? Okay, thanks. So I need to make a decision on Colonel Stallworth. I am her senior rater, okay? I see only so much of here. Under the current system, that is the only piece of information that is going to determine whether she gets promoted to the next rank. Colonel Calvert, would you mind standing up? Okay. Colonel Calvert is one of her peers or subordinates. He probably has some pretty important information about Colonel Stallworth that we want to know about Colonel Stallworth before we make a critical decision about him. So how do we fold that information? So now we've got you know, two points of information coming together. Colonel Jacobs, would you mind standing up? Okay. 
you represent the information that we get through cognitive and non-cognitive assessment and some screening done by psychiatrists. And so all of a sudden, we've got your senior rater insight, you've got your peer and subordinate insights, and you've got an impartial set of assessments done that give us a much better idea of whether Colonel Stallworth is the best candidate to be put in that position of responsibility. At the core of it, that's what the battalion commander assessment program is, uh, is trying to do, okay? And it's this idea of triangulating and bringing all this other relevant information that we as an Army should fold in to making this really important decision. You can go sit down. Okay, next slide. So what do we do? We grab the alternate list of infantry and armor officers, and we made them report down to, we are 26 of them, and we asked them to report down to Fort Benning so we could run a pilot program on what this would look like. Okay, so the first thing that happened is we sent the invitation to 26 and three came back and said, I'm not interested in doing it. Like, I don't want to be a battalion commander. So, okay. So that's fine. It was good to know. Uh, we set up a grading, uh, a grading scale that said we were going to score three events, cognitive and non-cognitive assessments. We're going to make them do a graduate skills diagnostic uh, test, which is online, sort of grammar test, and then make them write an essay, an argumentative essay, and an essay that we chose. And we're going to make them take an APFT. So we made, those are the three scored events to reestablish the, uh, the order of merit list. But then we added a bunch of other uh, events to gather information to help us make this decision. So we had them sit down and do a psychological test that, that went through that was a personality indicator and just general sort of uh, psychological assessment. They then had to sit down with a, uh, with a psychologist for about an hour to, to talk through the results of that. We sent out this thing called the Army Commander Evaluation Tool, which was a sort of streamlines 360 degree assessment, which you could fill out in about 10 minutes and effectively says, if you, you know, so we found those peers and subordinates that we sent this to. We went through and found out you know, who had been one of your peers or subordinates. We sent them the questionnaire, and then they very rapidly had to sort of answer a couple questions about you know, this individual's leadership style, and then really most importantly, would you recommend this person to be a battalion commander? And then we gave them a free form to be able to, uh, to, to fill that out in terms of making any sort of comments. I will just tell you that overwhelmingly, Overwhelmingly, like the 95%, the comments were positive to neutral. In very few cases were they actually negative. Uh, and then we did an interview process, and it was a blind board interview process. So the candidates came in after getting some information from the psychologist and taking a look at some of the information that had been anonymized. Okay, so it was it was candidate one, two, three, and four. They reported behind a screen, and then there was a structured interview that happened with six general officers asking them questions. Okay, and this was all just sort of a pass-fail. At the end of that, the panel members were asked to do a pass-fail vote on whether they thought those officers should go into, uh, into battalion command. So I'll talk you through the results. Next slide. So with the new OML, okay, what we found out is the average OML shifted about eight positions, so about 20, about 30% shift because we had about uh, 23 and they shifted eight. All BCAP candidates said that the BCAP was a better process for picking battalion commanders. Many of them recommend we do it on top of the standard CSL, so the CSL worked that. All seven general officers who sat on the panel said that this is a better way to pick battalion commanders within, uh, within our Army. But really, there are some other things that came out that were a little disturbing, too. Five of them failed. Okay, so two failed for height weight, three failed for being deemed by the panel board as being not, uh, not, not, the, not fit for command and they just thought they would be the wrong people to, uh, to put. And then we also took primaries, who were very high on the primary list, and we threw them in the second iteration of this and see how they would score against the, the, the alternate list. And one might think they would take one, two, three, and four. They took two, three, seven, and 13, yeah, out of, uh, out of 27 on that one. And so, again, when you bring in different and relevant information, you come up with different, uh, different, different choices on this. What the chief has decided is that in January, uh, a, notes, a notice about to go out to about 815 officers because the Lieutenant Colonel Central Selection Board has met. We have gone a straight OML. 815 officers will receive invitations to come to Fort Knox between the 15th of January and the 12th of February. And they will show up for a five-day period where they'll be run through this assessment process, which is modified a little bit based on the lessons that we've learned here. An order of merit list will be reestablished and that's how we're going to pick our primary and alternate. Uh, you should know that uh, a number of factors will be weighed, but the, the heaviest weighted criteria has been your manner of past performance as determined on how you did on the order of merit list coming out of the uh, Central Selection Board. But a lot of other factors are going to be used in this, uh, in this weighting as well, and there'll be a board process similar to how I, uh, how, how I, how I described it to you. Uh, next slide. Okay. I think I went over, I apologize. Again, I can stay here as long and answer as many questions as you would like, but down and dirty, that is, uh, that is where we are right now. 
So what questions do we have? Yes. So we have, we have people who are listening on the outs. Um, I had a question about um, matches bumping up against Manning guidance. Okay. Under what circumstances will matches in the marketplace be broken? This is a great question. Um, so I, the way you ask that question is a little bit off, though. Okay, so during the initial setting the conditions for the market, we have already established the positions that the Army has decided to fill. Okay, so let's just say you're CAC and the active component mining guidance says CAC is gonna be manned at 80%, and they have 100 open billets. They're gonna, CAC finds those 80 positions, they send that list to HRC, HRC validates those are the right 80 positions to fill. Those are the ones that are gonna be moved into the regulated marketplace in AIM-2 to get an assignment for. Okay, so, so that's, that's the first piece of it. It's not every job that's available comes open, just the ones that have gone through that process. And then the things that can break a match, okay, because I probably didn't emphasize this enough, if at all, um, is that a one-to-one -one match from an individual in a unit will not be broken unless it's an exceptional circumstance like it's EFMP or if it's like a Merit Army's couple program or something like that. We're trying to do all that work early in the system. But the general, and the, the philosophy is the market matches are maintained. And you know, one-to-one -one is obviously the most important, but you can have two-to-two -two or two-to-four, and those market matches are not gonna be tweaked with um, unless there are some of these things like you're not qualified because of security qualifications, you've got an EFMP issue or something like that. But it, I mean, to your point, it, 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 you have to maintain those matches, otherwise the system doesn't have a whole lot of validity. Now, here is one piece that we've been mindful of is you know, we're making these sort of calls about jobs about nine months before people fill, people show up because we're doing this in the summer cycle. So we have given the local commanders at the, at the posts the ability to tweak with up to 10%, but we're gonna track those numbers. And so the guidance is, if you are slated to go, if you are picked and chosen to go to a brigade, that the goal is 90% of the officers who are picked to go to that brigade are gonna go to that brigade and they're gonna stay at that brigade for, uh, for at least nine months. And after that, the senior mission commander can do it. Now, you know over nine to 10 months, things can change, like new operational readiness requirements can come, people can get sick or ill, things can happen that would cause some change, but we don't want it to be much more than 10%. If it happens, it's gonna trigger a, a flag. Okay, great question. I probably should, have, probably should have covered that earlier. What other questions? Yes. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Livingstone, uh, Question about uh, Army filling joint billets. Yeah. So right now, most a lot of the joint billets are like former battalion commander, former brigade commander billets. Uh, I'm from a smaller functional area, and we don't have those kinds of. And so sometimes we run into um, complications filling joint billets that are designated um, because that's sort of a, a standard uh, measuring stick across the services. Uh, is there any thought now into how this might play out? You know, if we look at um, matching the right officer and the right billet at the right time, uh, will it be limited in some way or expanded uh, in the joint world? So it is expanded in the joint world, and the, the man who has been working this is Colonel Michael Casares. So I will let the, him hit that in some detail. So I, I think you use, where, you where use we're going to start by going with this is you're, you're going, the first step is you're going to see all of the joint assignments. And I think that's a change from your assignment officer giving certain people, certain elements of the population, usually based on your MOP, the ability to get a nominative, a joint, or an OSD assignment. So step one is you're gonna see uh, all of those jobs listed and you are going to be able to con uh, contact the incumbents and you're going to be able to sell yourself based on your resume. So that's how we see the competition happening for those jobs. D does that answer your question? From what I understand, um, some some of the uh, joint hiring uh, uh, the decision makers uh, are going to be looking for uh, a minimum level. I, I don't I don't know if that'll change in the future or not. Okay, so so I think the big change here is that previously we had one dimension that we were looking at, and it was performance. And so what you're saying is hey, they only wanted to consider top performers. And that's kind of what I was saying, that your assignment officer was 
only showing those jobs to a certain subset of people. So what we want to change with talent management, instead of managing people based on past performance only, we want to give you, uh, the hiring agency, the ability to hire what seems to be that average officer who has a unique knowledge, skill, and behavior that qualifies them for that job. And so that, that's where we're going. Michael, let me, let me sort of reinforce that. So I think all of us are familiar with what happened when the Army tried to fill the SFAB mission. Remember the Security Force Systems Brigades. Okay, and this is really, I think, a great embodiment of what happens when you try to go from data poor to data rich. So the Chief Staff of the Army at the time said SFABs are important. We want to man this with high quality officers and let's just talk about captains. And we said as an Army, only top 10% captains can go in there. Well, if you're running this by only one dimension, which we generally tend to do, that means they did, took a review of all your last OERs and we said only those who are in the top 10% based on this MOP score you get. Whether you know it or not, you've all got a MOP score and it's a, quantita it's a quantitative measurement of how, how likely you are to be promoted in the, uh, at your next board. The flaw in that was, and I can say this because I commanded a Security Force Assistance Brigade, is that when you're looking at captains, you're really looking at company command positions within, you know, how they did as company commanders within the Army as captains. And so what we found is we found the top 10% or top 15% of company commanders, and we said this is the crew from which we're going to pick a, you know, advisors. So I, again, I commanded a security force assistance brigade, and I can tell you the skill sets that you need to be a great company commander are really different than the skill sets you need to be a great advisor. And I had some great company commanders who would be lousy advisors, and I had some great advisors who would be lousy company commanders. But when you run this enterprise in a data poor way, you only have one you know, measurement by which you can look at them, and you're always going to be in a constrained environment. But let's talk about what this could be like in the future. What it could be like in the future is you could say, hey, I want to find officers who would be good advisors. Okay? Let's say just for their performance, just as an initial screen, I want top 50% officers, okay? just, just as a rough sort of look at their OERs. But I want to have someone who has a high degree of cognition and a high degree of, of uh, cognitive flexibility. Maybe someone who's tested and measured well for cross-cultural uh, cross fluency. And then someone who in his own uh, self-described behaviors says that he or she likes to travel internationally and go to foreign countries. Because what better manifestation of what really you enjoy than how you spend your own time and money? And now, because of AIM-2, we've got a place where we can see all those things. And so now all of a sudden, when you're searching, doing the search parameters for the people that you want to bring in to be advisors, you get a very different set than just saying, give me the top 10% of all your company commanders. And so you get better advisors on one side of that. But the other thing is those people who wouldn't, so you get a mission, you get a lift in the operational effectiveness of your advisory mission. But for those people, those officers who are really, really good company commanders, you know, they don't get jammed into a position where they're always going to be frustrated and not doing very well, and they can work on some other skill sets. Maybe you send them to advanced civil school, and maybe you send them to an NTC or JRTC, and they infuse their skills into the force. But that's what it means, I think, when you start doing that. And so to your point from the joint, now you can see not just who, you know, who the sort of arbitrary screen is. There may be in the lower or the middle echelon some people who would be really, really good joint officers who could contribute to your mission because of what they bring to the uh, fight in terms of their own knowledge, skills, behaviors. And so that's what I think you're getting out an opportunity to see. What other questions? Hey, sir, good afternoon. Colonel Rob Parker. Thanks right. for your time with us today. Great to see you, uh, Rob. When I look at the roles in ATAP slide, specifically under roles of unit, it talks about being aware of nepotism. Right. I was wondering if you could take a minute to describe what kind of safeties or safety mechanisms are in place to preclude us from going down that road as an army. Yeah, so there, there are really sort of three things that people are concerned about, and I think we share the concern, okay, about, you know, having this hiring authority go this way. So one is nepotism two is performance distribution, and three is diversity. So let's just talk all three because that is, uh, that, is, that is one of them. Okay, so I'll answer yours directly. So nepotism. Um, so my first question to you would be, how do you know nepotism isn't happening under the current system and what mechanisms do we have to check against it? The answer is we have none. And then that we routinely and systematically check. Now we have an ability to actually check this. In these conversations, as we're trying to figure out how to do these, we are always in this conflict between, is this something we want to regulate so we can set a bunch of rules about nepotism and what that looks like, or is this something we just want to be able to illuminate so we can see how commanders are doing in terms of exercising this authority that they've been given? 
On the idea of nepotism, we decided that for this first iteration, we're going to try to illuminate that. Because when you really start trying to define nepotism, it gets a little bit tricky. Like, how many times can I go work for Rob Parker before it's nepotism? And if you're a brigade commander, should you be able to hire maybe three people out of 40 that you worked with before, or is that five people out of four? And so we just sort of thought, let's see how this goes, and we can take a look and do a run now that we've got the data. Commanders are specifically advised to make sure that they are open up to hiring all sorts of talents. Also, in terms of doing this with smaller subsets, when we did this in the green pages for the engineer corps, what we found was that engineer officers who were given a hiring authority entered into this process thinking they were going to hire their own people. But when they saw the totality of the talents that were out there, they made dramatically different decisions. Because you know, Colonel Hanson and I could have served together a number of times, and I thought for sure I was going to bring him onto my team. But when I see everyone who's out there, I'm like, well, He's really good, but the person I need is someone I hadn't even met before. And I just interviewed this person, and I came up with a very different hiring choice. So that's one. Diversity is something we're also going to keep an eye on. Make sure you're not hiring people who just you know, sort of look like you or don't look like you or whatever, whatever it is to be able to, to do that. And then the performance distribution. And again, that went out in the X order as well. And commanders will be evaluated on how well they do that. And, uh, and we've got the ability to look at that. And the other is performance distribution, as I sort of mentioned. We're going to, after we do the initial slating, we're going to stop and make, and, and make sure that we don't you know, really hurt in, in locations that are tough to fill. Because there remains a geographic component to where people want to serve within the, uh, the Army. And so we're not going to zero out you know, the brigade that's down at, at Fort Polk. We're going to take a look at what that, what that actually looks like. Okay? But, but Rob, those are, those, are, those are three concerns that we have. And we're going to take a hard look at that as we're executing this. Okay. What other questions? Yeah, please. Sir Colonel Brian Chapman, I'm an Army FAO. Uh, being in a small functional area, how many of the new authorities have been implemented or can be used to manage if you have shortage in populations, your 05s, 06s, and things like brevet promotions or extending MRDs would, would help? Uh, to fill the gaps that are in the force. So the brevet promotions we're about to do, you know, so we're given 770 positions. This first marketplace, regulated marketplace, has identified 225 positions. The extensions past 30 years is something we're still working to try to figure out. We bump into this issue of we're trying to extend people, but we're already over strength in terms of colonels for the Army. So, so we're working that right now to try to figure out what that, uh, what that looks like. But I think a place like FAO, where you've got a unique skill set, and there are not a lot of people coming behind you with those, I think it's, it's ripe for opportunities for stuff like that. Sir, uh, David Thomas, uh, quick question about, uh, I'm trying to understand, I understand the preferences between officer and units and how those marry up one to one, two to two, et cetera. How does the algorithm come in? Is that, I'm not a super strong math guy. Are you saying that's how we calculate the whole pool or how does, or, or is there some way of looking at the individual uh, uh, relationship between officer and unit? So I will start this off and then I'll turn it over to, to Colonel Kazara who has been working this at a much, so it is, it is based on the medical matching model, so the way that people get chosen for medical schools, but it is strongly based on preferences, okay? And the preferences weigh, you know, and it's a measure of weighing preferences between the units and the individuals, but the individual preferences have a stronger weight than the, uh, than the unit preferences in terms of how we do this matching as we're, as we're going forward. You wanna follow up, Michael? Sir, I would just dovetail. Um, first off, because we're short on time, there are two great videos out there. This is based on the National Medical Resident Matching Program, which won a Nobel Prize for being a very fair preference matching system. We've changed it to the Army Town Alignment Algorithm, which also has its own video on YouTube, if you Google that. Uh, but basically, we, we picked this. It's called a... Uh, officer proposing delayed algorithm. And what that means is it, there, there's really no gaming the system, which is why we chose this. So it doesn't advantage or disadvantage first movers. The market's open for 60 days. If you get your preferences in on day one or day 60, no advantage or disadvantage. It also allows uh, no one to game the system. Hey, I'd really like that job, but I don't think I have a shot at it, so I'm gonna make this other job my number one preference. This, this allows people to reveal their true preferences and, and without any gamesmanship that would alter uh, 
alter what they're what they're revealing as their preferences. So there, there's a couple a couple reasons we picked the algorithm right there, but I think the the videos are really illustrative and you get it immediately. Yeah, one other thing I forgot because they were being passed out. We did pass you out a handout. Okay, I'll take questions, but we did pass you out a handout. I would strongly ask you to take a couple minutes to fill that out. What's really important is you put your DOD ID number in there. We're not gonna come track you down unless you want us to. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna have any objections to anything that you say, but it allows us to say, hey, lieutenant colonels think this, captains think this, so I would ask you to put, uh, put all that information on there, and then as you leave, you know, hand that to our team in the, uh, in the back. Uh, what other questions do I have? Yeah. Yes, sir, Colonel Jason Davis from DAG3 Demo AV. So we've heard the complaints from the force on the, the old system or the current system. In two years or after a few cycles, what do you guys predict will be the complaints about the new system? And then what can we do to help the town management task force with messaging from the DA staff? Yeah, I, I think the first thing you're gonna find is some people are gonna be like, hey, I thought my preference mattered and like it didn't matter. Okay, well, that might be because you're not a particularly attractive candidate. Um, <laughs> And, and frankly, I think we're going to start gathering some of that information, right? Like, I mean, if you have to be forced, if you have to be forced into a job, you know, two or three assignment cycles, that's a pretty clear indication about the overall value of the skills that you bring to the Army. Uh, I think the, the immediate message, and I hit it a couple times, because we've never run it on these numbers before, is it's important for an individual to preference deeply and then for in, you know, in, units to preference deeply as well. As long as that happens, there's going to be some form of a match. Um, I do think one of the things that we've seen which is really positive is that officers are reaching out to mentors and now that they have all these sort of options and choices and they're saying like, how do you see me, where do you think I should go? And so anecdotally, we're getting a lot of feedback about how this is driving conversations that hadn't previously happened when it was much more sort of centrally controlled by HRC and you got a couple options and, uh, and you went forward. But that is one. But I think just the messaging is for people to understand how this whole system works, how their preference is weighted, and uh, and I'm sure there are going to be a whole bunch of unanticipated. I mean, you know, we're going to the, the the data analytics and the AR process. We built that into this entire pro in this prior process. It's going to be really interesting to see what we find out. But uh, I don't, know, Michael. Can you think of anything we're anticipating seeing in the next year to two years? in terms of, of major or significant issues? No, sir, I think you hit it. I mean, you just have to, th there's one market that has 757 officers in it. So somebody is going to get their 700th choice. So, I mean, you just need to be more accustomed to, hey, this is great, I got my 57th choice. I mean, there's just a change in culture that Absolutely. people are gonna have to get used to. The, the other thing is, the other, sir, I knew you were gonna, I knew you were gonna have a question. It's gonna be a hard one, too. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the other thing is it was interesting, so I had these conversations with some people who've been you know, in the personnel management world for, uh, you know, for a long, long time, and they'll say stuff like, hey, JP, you know, in, in, in my experience, all, you, all officers want to do is go to a post. And what I point out is, in your entire experience, it's the only choice you've given to an officer, right? Because like, you don't get assigned to a unit, you get assigned to a post, and the senior mission commander there is the one who assigns you down. So I think some of that stuff is going to be really interesting to see about, about when, when officers are given the ability to go actually to a particular unit as opposed to a particular post, how that starts shaping preferences and start, uh, starts bringing in this information. Hey, Sir. JP, just for the record, I, I, w I wanted everybody to know th I had to ask a question because this row just won the Spring Bud Award. <laughs> That's an important <laughs> award to have. Hey, I, I, I got into AIM-2 today, mm -hmm. and I was going down through all of our open requisitions, and I was taking a look at the section where we're able to put in, you know, specific qualifications for the job, uh, KSBs. Um, and I found myself, particularly for the crew that we have, um, really placing a, a, a premium on certain master's degrees, right? This issue associated with Information Age Army, the Chief's push. Over the last two POM review cycles, advanced civil schooling funding has taken it in the shorts. Absolutely. Just put it lightly, gang. I, there's no better way for me to say that. Um, that said, um, if you could establish the the data-driven foundation for what folks are asking for inside AIM-2. There may be more ammunition inside the TTPEG deliberation in particular, and I was just wondering for your thoughts on that. 
Sir, sir, I think that is, I think that's a great point. And I think it is one of a number. I mean, it is, it is already interesting. So, sir, I agree with you. I agree with everything you said. And I think we are going to start getting really good insights about the, the mismatch between the skills we wish we had and the available inventory of officers. I think I'd start driving things like funding of certain degrees and incentivizing officers to do that. And again, that's a data rich. Already we're seeing things that I think are really interesting that we hadn't even considered sort of the ramifications of it. So, for example, uh, you know, we have now been able, after a couple of runs of this, to talk mathematically about which posts are most preferred and which are least preferred. And there's sort of a cutoff point where you know, they're more preferred than least preferred. And one of the ones that's on the other end of the, of the, on the least preferred side is Fort Bliss. So I was having this conversation with the, uh, with the commanding general out at, uh, out at uh, Fort Bliss, General you know, Patrick Matlock. And he said, he said, look, I can't wait to see this data because I'm going to take this information and I'm going to go to the leaders at Fort Bliss and, and, uh, in El Paso and say, look, you're not an attractive, you know, you know, you're not a destination of choice. You're not a post of choice. So we need to do something together to make El Paso and the surrounding community and Fort Bliss a more attractive place to be. And so you know, that's the institutional level and the individual. But, sir, I think, I think what you just mentioned is going to be important, but I think it's going to be one of 100 other things that we see as we, as we finally have like a coherent data structure from which we can learn this. Because what everyone's always told me, and again, I, I, can, I can say these things I don't fully understand, but when you start actually getting a cohesive framework to gather your data, you start off you know, get, trying to think you've got some, you want to get answers to certain questions, and then you find out you're not even asking the right questions because there are these linkages amongst the data, and I think that's just one of them. So that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Uh, sir, Captain uh, Carl Yurick, I'm over in OCLL. And from a younger generation perspective, um, is there any protections to put in place for, say, units with niche skills, like uh, going to the 82nd and, hey, we only want majors that are jump masters. Is that mm -hmm. going to kind of close the window? Or are there areas in there that, that will leave that option open for, for people to get into those type of units that they want to hunt down? So, you know, so again, you know, you want to go to the 82nd and you're a high quality officer. I think what this allows you to do is have a dialogue with that brigade commander who has that hiring authority and you get a chance to say, here's why I'm a great fit to come to the, uh, the 82nd. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to a jump unit before, but here are the reasons why. But what we are doing increasingly is we're eliminating all these restrictions that would say you couldn't go there. And so now you've got an opportunity to actually see what those positions are, compete for them, and you can have that dialogue with the hiring authority, the brigade commander, to make that happen. Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Jones, you kind of mentioned that there will be a number of officers that won't get their choices and that will end up being at the bottom of the pool or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of wondering, what's that feedback loop for those officers that aren't doing so well and since we have now all these metrics and all this information, yeah. how will they get the information to them so they can actually, you know, improve their chances or their Yeah, it, it, so it's a great question. So let me give you a, so you see these questionnaires we just passed out. I will, I will give you one of the pieces, one of the, one of the data that we've, uh, we've brought together. This shouldn't be a surprise to you. But 75% of the officer corps that we've asked this question to, and I think now the data sets about 1,600 officers. So it's fairly stable at this point, like numbers aren't going to change. But about 75% of the officer corps that we surveyed think that they're in the top 25% of the officer corps. Okay. So we clearly have an issue with visibility in terms of where we are. I think when we start bringing assessments into this, and certainly in the first 10 years of an officer, you're starting to be able to see these things, and you start getting this feedback, and it's objective. It's not just my opinion of you. It's actually a, a, you know, a, a fair measurement of your, uh, of your skills. I think people will start getting a better feel for, uh, for where they are, and I think that starts driving maybe different either career choices or fields that they go into, and I, and I think there's a whole lot of value in that because I don't think right now officers really see themselves accurately in terms of their own skills or even how they sort of rack and stack within their career field. What else? Yep. Sir, do you see at one point uh, other branches competing for billets that are in a, you know, a different branches billet? For example, uh, you know, being the G6 out of Fort Carson, it was hard to get people to come out and become Brigade S6s and serve in that billet. But, you know, there could be an infantry armor officer or, you know, or even a logistician that could fill that Brigade S6 billet and compete for it. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't gone that far. Um, I mean, I would still see a Brigade S. First off, I don't think there are any billets that are hard to fill at Fort Carson, as far as I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> 
But um, I, uh, well, interestingly, Fort Carson's super popular, much more popular than like Hawaii, which again, you wouldn't know. I mean, I would have always thought Hawaii was more, but, but I think Fort Carson, because it's still located in the continental United States, certainly as you become higher ranking, I think people start having kids and they want to be, they want to stay in the United States. Fort Carson is very, very popular. Um, but yeah, you know, we haven't really looked at that yet. I think, you know, right now as we're seeing this, you'd still want to have a signal officer doing that, uh, doing that role. Now, I thought you were going to go in a different direction. You know, we sort of code different jobs post like Brigade S6. And so right now, if there are these billets that are open, there, there are only there are a chunk that go to infantry officers. I think you could see, we could see expanding that in terms of how they manage that at a, at a lower level, but not, not as you're sort of describing, at least not, uh, not anytime soon. That's not something we're looking at. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, I really appreciate your time. Apologize for going 20 minutes over. It's very hard for me to do this in an hour and you guys had great questions. I will stick around here if there are, uh, if there are any questions. And, and I will just end with, uh, with, a, with just a couple thoughts that I think is really important for us all to understand. Uh, you know, we have a Chief of Staff of the Army, General McConville, who spent uh, three years as the G1 and two years as the Vice. Okay. At least in my time in the Army, I don't think we've ever had a chief who has understood the people side of the Army better than General McConville. There is a reason why he says this is his number one priority, because he understands the system and he understands how we need to make it significantly better to retain the right talent to win future wars. And at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. And then the final piece of this is, you know, I have, uh, I have seen this in lots of different fields as well. But everybody loves change until that change impacts them. <laughs> it's just true. We all hate change. And if you tell me you don't I hate change, I, I'm not sure I'm going to believe you. But as we're doing this, make sure, I mean, understand that we're doing this for the reasons of making the Army more competitive, more ready for future, uh, for future fights. And then make sure you spend the time to understand the reasons why and mentor your subordinates on, on how this is going forward. And then as we go forward, uh, we are always open to your inputs on how to make this better. Okay, like I don't think we have every answer. I think we are we are, are clear on a direction that we're moving out, but we rely upon your feedback to make this whole system better. Okay, thank you very much.